Right. Uh, so, uh, welcome to tonight's Socialist Resistance online public meeting. And uh, what we're going to be looking at this evening is the economic situation in Britain, United States, and globally. Uh, we should advise you that the meeting is being recorded and that will include the questions and answers. So, if you ask a question and you don't want it to be included in the uploaded version, uh, please indicate in the chat and we can take that into account. Uh, our next meeting is in a fortnight and you can register for that on the website or in the follow-up emails subsequent to this meeting, which is, and it's gonna be on labor, Palestinian rights and anti-Semitism uh, with uh, Gilbert Ashkar, author of several books on the Middle East, uh, Jenny Mason of Jewish Voice for Labor and prominent Palestinian activist, uh, Chris Hamiz. Uh, Socialist Resistance is a, a British organisation in sympathy with the Fourth International and the Fourth International's website is International Viewpoint, which is updated virtually daily with a range of articles from all around the globe. A lot of stuff there at the minute about uh, the uh, pandemic internationally that you won't be getting in the uh, mainstream bourgeois press. Uh, our speakers are uh, in Brooklyn, in New York, and in uh, Serbian, in southwestish London, somewhere south of the river anyway. Um, and Osna Monaran is a professor of economics at Greenwich University. Osna is going to be talking about the scale of the crisis, her prediction that it's unlikely there's going to be a quick bounce back economically, and uh, what our eco-socialist feminist solutions to that might be. I was going to speak for about 10, 15 minutes thereabouts. Would we aim to finish something between 8.15 and 8.30, so you can plan your evening around that. Okay, awesome. Would you like to start? Uh, thank you very much, Liam. Let me start by sharing my screen such that it's easier to follow. Um, Can everyone see that? Yes. The shared screen, okay. Thank you very much for having me. Uh, obviously everything I will be saying today is subject to a lot of assumptions and there is huge uncertainty around these assumptions, uh, starting with the reproduction rate of the virus, how it will evolve. Uh, we know very little about the rate of immunity in the populations uh, and how long that immunity uh, lasts. Um, uh, we don't know when um, and if we will have a vaccine uh, or treatment and when there is one uh, who will uh, get the first treatment or vaccine, there will be huge uh, inequalities uh, both globally uh, and uh, across classes, age groups uh, around that. Uh, obviously, we don't know uh, the uh, duration of the lockdown um, and if there will be an repeat of lockdown after uh, lifting of the lid and how intensive will be the next wave of lockdown. Uh, we know very little uh, if uh, we will have uh, more waves uh, of this virus. Everybody is uh, quite conscious that there may be a, a second peak, but there may be more waves. Uh, and when there are more waves, again, since we don't know the rate and duration of immunity, it's very difficult to say how strong those new waves will be. And of course, uh, it's not my area to talk about, but uh, we know very little about the mutation of this virus. Having said all these, what we know so far, this is the deepest economic crisis we are facing. It is a depression, the word is in place here, and it's something we haven't seen for three centuries, uh, at least if we look at the, uh, the UK data uh, but but uh, it suffices to say that it applies um, quite uh, broadly. Um, I'm going to speak mostly about the UK context, but try to relate it to the global uh, scale as well. But just the, the very recent Bank of England forecast for 2020 is that in the course of the year as a whole, UK gross domestic product is expected to fall by 14%. Um, a lot of that will be very intensive uh, uh, in the times, in the months we are living. So they're expecting 
uh, about one third of a fall in uh, national income in the first half of this year. Uh, if you look at the global scale, uh, there are estimates coming from the European Commission for the European Union gross domestic product, which is expected to fall by about seven and a half percent. Obviously, uh, there are risks of a new sovereign debt crisis hitting uh, southern uh, Europe, and there is at the moment uh, very few policies that address that uh, substantially, and. Uh, there are only very uh, small parts of the world, in, um, uh, like in China and some Asian emerging uh, economies, where there won't be a recession this year, just a fall in uh, output. So overall, the IMF forecast is that world uh, output will fall by about 3.5%. Now, at the moment in Britain, um, already there is massive uh, underemployment in the sense that uh, about one out of four uh, of employees are furloughed, uh, and it's a scheme that has been today extended all the way until end of uh, October with some uh, modifications and added flexibility and a bit of tapering. Um, the official forecast is that unemployment in Britain at the end of this year will increase about uh, up to 10%. Uh, but a lot will depend on uh, what the government policies uh, will be to arrest unemployment. And there are more pessimistic expectations coming from a former uh, Monetary Policy Committee member, uh, Danny Blanchflower, that size UK unemployment may well increase to 20%. Um, there is a risk of deflation, uh, meaning prices starting uh, falling. Uh, though, if you look at the uh, inflation facing working class households, it's a lot about their food basket. So a risk of deflation for broadly the economy may well be coupled with uh, increasing price inflation uh, for uh, basic necessities, primarily uh, for food. Now, all of these numbers or most of these numbers are coming from official estimates, but the official estimates are also saying we will bounce back uh, next year in 2021. There will be a recovery that is stronger than the recession in 2020. So that's what people call a V-shaped uh, crisis, a deep, steep fall, but a steep recovery. Now, um, uh, most economists, uh, not only the radical ones, say this is very unlikely. This is the official Bank of England or Office of Budget Responsibility position in their forecasts, but we all know this is very unlikely. Uh, the more likely uh, version is there will be a uh, U-shaped recovery, meaning uh, the recession will last, there won't be full recovery in 2021, uh, and then there will be a late start uh, to the recovery. Why this is the case? Let me walk you through the stages of this crisis we will see. We will go through probably a vicious circle of overlapping multiple crises. Uh, we started with the pandemic, which is a supply side uh, shock. It's a supply side crisis that uh, brought the lockdown uh, together with it and a huge rise in uncertainty. That of course translated very quickly into a fall in consumption, investment in demand in the economy. Uh, and that uh, brought together uh, a rise in unemployment uh, and an increase in poverty, loss of massive amounts of income for the very vulnerable parts of uh, the society. And of course, Britain is already caught in the middle of several vulnerabilities, one of which is the household debt, the high debt levels of um, most working class households. And of course, the crisis is now intensifying the debt problem for uh, households, but also uh, firms. Now, uh, when the debt problem of households and firms turn into insolvencies, that's gonna then translate itself into a problem for the banking sector. Although banks um, are set to be in a better position than they were when they were caught by the 2007-8 financial crisis, uh, still, that will be a big shock to the banking system, and we will see uh, a complete crunch of credit for firms. 
So that's all intensifying to already existing problems. Um, in the meantime, you're seeing we will see more of that, an increased concentration of capital and an increase, of course, concentration of power around that. I mentioned the problem in Europe, uh, similar debt problems is increasing for Southern European countries, but also it will become a burning issue for a lot of the developing economies. Argentina is uh, already in a situation of uh, default uh, negotiations that have been postponed, uh, but um, by no means Argentina is the only country. There are quite a few of these countries in Latin America and Africa. Um, so th all these are, of course, increasing uncertainty that we are going through uh, further, and this will lead to further downward spiral in demand. Firms won't invest, consumptions, uh, households won't consume. So all these are very unlikely to bounce back in 2021 simply. Uh, and we know that some firms may never recover from this crisis. And uh, worse, this may apply to uh, some sectors altogether who may uh, never uh, recover. So obviously, this is increasing the already existing polarization in the society, about which I'm going to speak more in a uh, minute. But uh, this is all uh, a breeding ground for us. Uh, intensification of social and political crises uh, as well. If you want to arrest such a vicious circle, you need massive stimulus, uh, much more than what we have at the moment in terms of both monetary policy, but uh, also in terms of fiscal stimulus uh, policy. Um, however, um, although I would normally uh, be a strong advocate of fiscal stimulus uh, because it would be really able to arrest uh, an economic uh, recession. In this particular pandemic situation, obviously the effectiveness of fiscal stimulus, while it will be positive, it won't be as big as what we would expect under a normal recession because fiscal stimulus effectiveness comes from stimulating demand, investment, household consumption, as you can imagine, in the situation of pandemic, these effects would be a lot more muted. Uh, I don't have to remind people in Britain about the added uncertainty coming from Brexit that was here, and it's getting even more uncertain because of the crisis itself. Um, and of course, uh, we have to probably be mindful of the fact that uh, the current government came to power with the idea of defining the standard conservative fiscal uh, credibility uh, rules uh, with the promise of launching a huge stimulus of public infrastructure spending in the so-called red wall uh, cities in uh, Britain. Now, they will try to do that, but still they will feel uh, the pressure to do some austerity down the line come a couple of years time. So we may find ourselves in a situation of selective stimulus for some to meet the election pledges, while we see austerity for others. I work in higher education. I'm very mindful of what expects me in two years time. Um, and of course, uh, what we see is on the one hand, a massive unforeseen need for monetary and fiscal policy, and a need for better planning and coordination. But at the same time, we're all uh, observing how little state capacity there is out there to plan and coordinate urgent critical actions in a timely manner. So this is going to be very uh, tricky. Now, um, very quickly about where we are today in terms of the recession we are expecting versus the public health uh, and the debt uh, toll uh, this crisis is bringing on us. Um, there seems to be no trade-off between economic performance versus uh, performance in terms of public health or uh, debt numbers. So this is a graph uh, from the Financial Times database. The vertical axis is 2020 forecast for GDP growth. Indeed, it's all negative. That means the rate of recession. And the horizontal uh, axis is the cumulative debts uh, from COVID per million. The data is from uh, the 6th of May. So this is a scatter of different countries in Europe, North America, and Asia. Um, if you see here, there's, it, it appears that if you put all countries together, there's even a 
an expected downward uh, relation between uh, these two, meaning deeper recession coupled with higher uh, debt numbers. But if you look more carefully and abstract from the outliers of South Korea, very successful case, meaning very mild expected recession with very low uh, debt uh, numbers. Uh, and if you take out maybe even Japan here, and if you try to fit a, a relationship here for Northern Europe and the US, um, you see that there seems to be an inverted U-shaped relation, meaning there are some countries where you would think of a trade-off, so uh, better economic performance, meaning milder recession, went along with higher debt uh, numbers, but then there is a peak here and then a downward turn of the relationship in the sense that there are countries like the UK here, unfortunately, where you see uh, the recession will be one of the deeper ones and the debt numbers uh, seems to be among the higher uh, in the in international comparison. But of course, uh, countries had uh, underlying conditions, if you like, in terms of the health of their economies and existing inequalities uh, is one of the most important of these and the inequalities and this crisis are mutually reinforcing each other. Inequalities here refer to a bunch of uh, dimensions that are of course overlapping, there's a lot of intersectionality that makes the effects for, of the crisis for certain uh, parts of uh, the population much deeper uh, and of course this is uh, leading to also uh, the economic effects but also public health effects to be uh, worse. Of course racial inequality is uh, very bluntly there. Um, people talk less about class, uh, they talk a lot about education um, and, and so on, but there's clearly a class aspect. So there are within class uh, differences as well, if you look at working class. Um, uh, women in terms of debt toll, while it seems like they're uh, being affected is less than uh, men, in terms of time poverty or issues like increased domestic abuse are of course carrying the biggest uh, toll of this crisis. And they're also together with the young people among the ones who tend to be more working in low paid professions, sectors that are now being very deeply affected from the lockdown. Uh, of course, a lot of them are also in the care uh, economy, uh, working as uh, caregivers uh, in the public uh, and, and private uh, care uh, sector, paid care sector or in addition to their unpaid care burden. And of course, this is one of the professions where we see a disproportionately high uh, rate of death. Uh, of course, again, uh, migrants are among this group that's being uh, disproportionately negatively affected, young people, but also sometimes you forget about the 50 plus uh, group of workers, if they lose their jobs, it will become very difficult for them to move uh, on. So there is that uh, age group as well. Uh, people like to talk about uh, low skill versus uh, uh, high skill workers, but I like talking about education, obviously people without degrees, uh, doing sometimes the most important jobs that we call key workers are actually among the ones uh, who are uh, being very clearly uh, uh, in, in more risky professions but also some of them are uh, working in sectors that are being uh, very much affected from the uh, lockdown, uh, like in uh, hospitality uh, sector. There's a clear difference from manual versus office workers, so people who can work from home among the working class uh, seem to be, of course, faring very differently than people uh, who have uh, manual uh, jobs. Uh, again, there's a big gap between renters versus homeowners, and of course, renters tend to be younger, uh, they tend to be disproportionately work in jobs affected by the lockdown, who may never recover even after a uh, gradual lifting of uh, the uh, lockdown. So these will be the households that will be very clearly affected by increasing debt burden. Uh, if you're already in debt, which uh, quite substantial parts of the UK households are, of course, this crisis will be very heavy. And there are regional uh, differences. Um, but what I want to say is obviously austerity and deregulated labor markets in Britain 
um, or in countries like uh, the US are making all the effects of the crisis uh, much worse. And we should remember crisis do leave distributional scars, even a normal recession. So this crisis will leave a very deep distributional scar on inequalities. I hear Oslo, this- you've had almost 20 minutes. Okay, well then let me skip the other data I have, but let me end with what should we say in terms of alternatives in the aftermath of this crisis. Whatever we say, should address the short-term emergency response. So we can't brush over that, but we have to make the effort to push to link that to long-term rebuilding of our societies. So uh, surely flexible short working time arrangements, flexible furlough is something we want to uh, push uh, forward. Uh, we want uh, to add job guarantee schemes uh, to that. But probably on our part, we want to add things like education grants, uh, scrapping the tuition fees for people who want to uh, change careers, and also advocate paid on the job training associated with such job guarantee schemes. But moving forward, what we have to be saying is permanent redeployment in jobs that are most needed by uh, the society in the form of public sector jobs with decent uh, wages where we value our manners. And of course, I'm very uh, fond of the Green New Deal, but I want to add to that a Purple New Deal that addresses the need for public investment in also social care infrastructure. So a purple social and green physical uh, infrastructure push. Um, and of course, all these are strongest if they are coordinated across countries but you can still do it even if you do it in just one single country. We should uh, start talking seriously about national collective or cooperative ownership of key industries with elements of democratic participatory decision-making and planning uh, and talk about universal free basic services ranging from health to social care, education, childcare, to public transport. We should talk about housing, banking, and now this crisis makes it very clear we should also talk about food production as part of such key industries that can't be simply left to uh, multinational corporations and markets and of course municipal services now uh, there is a lot of talk about short working time arrangement as uh, an immediate crisis emergency solution but we should link that also a permanent shortening of working hours with wage compensation and of course, one of the things that uh, interests me a lot, living in Surbiton, I want to see a discussion of travel time counted as working time, particularly if I have to do social distancing while queuing for my train. And um, of course, working from home uh, proved to be a privilege, but it would be very interesting to reclaim that area, again, uh, in an effort to balance work and life, along with shorter working hours permanently, and of course, that is something that defies the logic of extracting labor from labor power. There are obvious other things, but I should mention them. We have seen how detrimental has been zero hours contracts and dodgy self-employment practices. We have to ban all of these. Of course, I'm very happy to hear Angela Rayner calling for union membership and collective bargaining. I will certainly not do anything in my workplace without consulting my trade union. Last but not least, we should get serious about debt moratorium restructuring, maybe linking debt payment to income, and at the end of the line, serious cancellation. Um, so we need to talk about both the secured and unsecured debt of households, utility and tax payments of households, but also small and medium scale enterprises. We need to seriously talk about the debt of the renters, but also tie that to the idea of rent controls. And of course, globally, we need to talk about that cancellation for developing uh, countries. Whenever uh, a firm is benefiting from any of that, it has to come with conditionality. A minimum condition for me is no workers should be laid off. There is money to finance that. The bread and butter is taxation, not of just income, but also wealth, uh, but also borrowing borrowing particularly to Spain in this purple green new deal. Monetary policy has to get real and have a permanent character that it has to fund public investment uh, projects. 
labor has to uh, bring back the national investment back, uh, bank plan. And of course, if we achieve all this together with increasing equality, that supports the budget too. And thanks for the extra time, Liam. So I'll yes, stop you here, stop sharing this, and the organizers have the slides if anybody wants to have them. Thank you. Well, Okay, thanks very much for that, Osam. Um, you can fiddle around on your computer and there's a way of giving a virtual clap or thumbs up if you want to acknowledge uh, the contributions. So um, our next speaker is Doug Henwood and uh, Doug's in uh, Brooklyn at the moment. He's going to be talking about the United States economy, but if um, you want a fuller discussion of American politics currently, um, a couple of weeks ago, we had a, di a discussion with uh, Joanna Misnick and Dan Labotz, both socialist activists in the United States. That's online and uh, you can watch that. Uh, what I suggest is if you've got any questions, you can type them in uh, to the question and answer function. If you want to speak, if you could indicate that in brackets beside your question, I'll give priority to uh, women uh, who want to contribute to the discussion. Uh, and Doug is the editor of the Left Business Observer. Uh, he's an economic analyst and a contributing editor to The Nation. He's going to be looking at the um, United States situation, why that economy is so massively unprepared, the weakness of the productive sector and the lineaments of a Green New Deal in the United States. Doug? Hey, thank you. Uh, and uh, I want to apologize uh, for uh, my U.S. focus on this. I think this is a combination of uh, normal Yankee provincialism compounded by the head-spinning experience of watching uh, the idiocy of Trump's management of this intense crisis. Uh, so it's really kind of hard to think uh, outside uh, of this, uh, this circle. I want to uh, agree with just about everything Oslo said, so uh, uh, both the analysis and uh, the forecast and the prescription, um, all those things I, I, I entirely agree with. Uh, and I may actually repeat some of that material, for which I apologize. I agree that a V-shaped recovery is very unlikely. Uh, things are just really very, very damaged, and it's hard to see how you bounce back from that very quickly. Uh, the stock market uh, is surreally priced for a strong recovery, but that, that may actually just be the two and a half trillion dollars the Fed has pumped into the financial markets talking. Um, but like, looking at this crisis, it's really not just an intense health and humanitarian crisis and uh, the worst economic crisis in decades, uh, perhaps ever, but it's one that is also exposing the deep fissures in U.S. society in such fascinating and profound ways. Uh, the deep polarization by class, race, region. These, these uh, long-standing fissures are really being exposed by the effects of the disease um, and uh, who gets forced to go back to work, who gets to work at home, um, you know, the nature of job loss, all really amplifying those long-standing divisions. Uh, the, uh, the minimal safety net of the United States. Uh, we're suffering from decades of very serious private and public underinvestment. Uh, of course, there's uh, our insane healthcare system, not just in, in, in the way it's financed, uh, the, the heavy reliance on private insurance and such, but also the distribution of healthcare resources, uh, the, the, the uh, location of hospitals in rich parts uh, of the country and uh, the underserved areas of, of, of poor urban neighborhoods and rural areas where hospitals are going bankrupt, closing, even in the midst of this crisis. Uh, we have a collapse of state capacity. Uh, decades of railing against the public sector has left government uh, and, and decades of austerity and, and cuts have uh, left the public sector uh, hopelessly unable to cope with the situation, which I think uh, also explains a good bit of the, uh, the problem in Britain now. Uh, and the relentless effects of neoliberalism on the public consciousness. It's really shaped the common sense in the population based on competitive individualism with an eroded sense of social solidarity. Now, some people are behaving pretty well under this, but you know, also see uh, these nuts with guns uh, entering uh, 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 restaurants uh, or uh, state capital buildings, uh, trying to open the, uh, the, uh, the society up, as they say, uh, at, at gunpoint. Uh, there's a famous photo making the rounds on the internet of a guy in a uh, sandwich shop in North Carolina who's carrying two pistols and a bazooka. This is a, a good bit of America at this point. Now, a few more uh, uh, details on each of those points. Uh, public investment that is net of, depre net of depreciation has barely been above zero uh, for more than a decade, meaning that we're doing little better uh, than replacing things as they rot. 
And much of the time, it feels, if you walk around the country, it feels like we're not even doing that. It just feels like everything is shabby and falling to pieces. Uh, on the private side, uh, there have been Corporations have been rather light on capital to spending despite pretty high profitability. Uh, there's been an emphasis on uh, short-lived investment, uh, 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 heavy investment in intellectual property, but not so much on machinery and equipment, which is the uh, where uh, innovation and growth come from. Uh, U.S. corporations have spent over $5 trillion buying back their own stocks since 2009, trying to boost its price over half their operating profits, and that's supplemented by heavy borrowing. Uh, and so they entered the crisis with very, very little in the way of a cushion. We've been running a just-in-time economy, not just you know, the, the, the habits of, of manufacturers running light inventories and expecting you know, deliveries uh, a day before they're supposed to go into the product. But in fact, uh, the entire economy has been that. Uh, there's no financial uh, cushion for corporations. We have no spare intensive care units. Um, we've just, uh, just been running everything close to the bone so that uh, uh, profits can be maximized and uh, the take of rich people uh, can be expanded. We have a capitalist class that seems to have lost interest in the long term. Uh, and I, you know, I don't want to get too romantic about the past, but it does seem more and more short term and greedy than uh, I, I certainly in, in modern history. Uh, a substantial portion of the capitalist class, especially the portion that leans right, the people around the Koch network, for example, or even a good bit of the Trump administration and the Republican Party, are into the smash and grab ethic of uh, private equity. Uh, that's Trump's own background itself. He just loaded up properties with debt, took out money, and left them to collapse. That's been his modus operandi. His Commerce Secretary, Wil uh, Wilbur Ross, comes out of that. His good friend, Steve Schwartzman, uh, one of his top economic advisors, uh, is, uh, comes out of that, that realm. It's just, uh, um, it's kind of, uh, my friend Christian Parenti calls the necrotic phase of American capitalism. That dimensions of this economic crisis are stunning. Uh, in April alone, we lost over 20 million jobs, roughly one in eight. Uh, unemployment uh, officially reported almost 15%, but as the Bureau of Labor Statistics pointed out uh, in that uh, statistical release, many people misclassified themselves in the survey form, so the real rate is close to 20%, um, and I think we're going to see it go another five or seven points higher uh, next month. It took over two years to get to this point of unemployment, this level of unemployment after the 1929 stock market crash, and we've done it in two months, which is really quite an impressive performance. We have uh, seen trillions of dollars of bailout money between the so-called CARES Act, which is a, an acronym, I can't remember what it stands for, that was passed by Congress, roughly two, two trillion there. And the Federal Reserve so far has uh, spent about two and a half trillion dollars It conjured largely out of thin air. Now, if you add those two together, the four and a half trillion dollars works out to almost $14,000 per capita. But people are just getting $1,200 checks, and many of them with very, very long delays. Uh, and that $1,200 is, a equivalent of roughly two or three weeks of household income. So uh, vast amounts of money being spent uh, to prop up things like private equity and uh, um, exchange traded bond funds uh, and um, large businesses uh, all getting many, many, many hundreds of billions of dollars, uh, but the, the broad population getting $1,200 if they're lucky. The uh, small business bailout, which was designed to uh, try to preserve uh, employment uh, during the, uh, the crisis, uh, has been a total disaster. Um, the amounts were um, insufficient to start with, but it's been very badly distributed. The least affected um, area is getting more money than the most affected. Uh, they administered the program through banks because we don't really have a public sector that can administer that. They, also, the, uh, the tax authorities who are supposed to, deli uh, to uh, deliver the uh, 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 the $1,200 checks to the public have uh, been really overwhelmed and done a rather bad job of it. Now, it's odd for a Marxist to defend bailing out small business, but most won't be able to uh, survive to reopen when this is all over. So any hopes for a recovery will be uh, uh, challenged by uh, the fact that a whole lot of businesses just won't be there to reopen and rehire. Now, I read somewhere the other day that Joe Biden uh, is uh, planning a big uh, Franklin Roosevelt act should he uh, become president next year. And I think that's actually kind of likely um, that he will win, but uh, although it doesn't seem that way, may not seem that way now. But there's really nothing in his personal history or in the, uh, you know, the, the general mainstream of the Democratic Party that make this FDR act seem credible. But uh, okay, let's, uh, let's uh, think about that for a moment. Here are some uh, ideas of how to get that kind of big FDR act going. Now we need to uh, do something uh, about 
the financial sector. This is, this is not crisis didn't, unlike the last one, this crisis didn't originate in the financial sector, but it's uh, having uh, repercussions in the financial sector and the Federal Reserve is making great efforts to keep things from imploding. Um, but, uh, and I think it is necessary to keep the financial sector from imploding or things would get even worse than they are. But it should be made conditional. Uh, we should need to reverse the IMS conditionality when it was restructuring Latin American debt in the 1980s. Uh, we need some kind of people's conditionality uh, on financial uh, sector, uh, financial sectors it's bailed out. And by that I mean ending speculative finance, turn the sector to something like a utility uh, that provides uh, basic services and no more, no more of this speculative nonsense. Uh, now, there are whole several industries which are in deep trouble, and I think rather than try to bring them back to life, many of them should be just uh, euthanized uh, while protecting the workers and the communities that might suffer in the transition, but uh, there really uh, is no reason for some of these to come back to the way they were or at all. Uh, cruise lines, massively destructive, ecologically gross things. They should be just gone. They don't need to be bailed out. Airlines, drastically shrunk. Uh, it's an environmentally destructive practice, uh, very, very destructive. Uh, and um, they, they also need drastically to be shrunk. Uh, we need to begin the process of putting the entire carbon sector out of business. There's a lot of trouble in fracking companies in particular in the US, but also a lot of larger oil companies are having trouble. Uh, Shell uh, uh, slashed its dividend uh, in, in an effort to prepare for what they see as a uh, weakening oil demand. But I think we really need to accelerate this process, accelerate the transition away from carbon towards renewable um, energy. Uh, we need to think about uh, the auto industry, which is also in trouble, a massive decline in car sales, uh, which is likely to continue. Uh, we need to transfer that industry, into, tra uh, transform that industry into something uh, that makes sustainable vehicles and no more of these uh, environmentally destructive monsters that they've been making. And uh, wrestle the pharmaceutical industry with its high prices and interest in profit rather than healthcare. healthcare. We need finally to rest, uh, wrestle that thing to the ground. We, um, in the spirit of the New Deal, we need to invest in the physical and uh, social infrastructure. But the green side of it is important. It mustn't be the same kind of infrastructure, not more airports, you know, not more uh, highways. What we need is the uh, creative infrastructure, sustainable energy, and transportation. And I hadn't heard the term purple New Deal before either, but I, I certainly agree with that. And it is part of uh, the, uh, the proposal for a Green New Deal in the U.S., which has a large expanded welfare state provisions, along with uh, the traditional infrastructure kind of thing that we think of New Deal. We need to create a, a different kind of agriculture and food system, one that's also ecologically sustainable. Um, and, uh, you know, a, a Pandemics like this arise uh, in part because of very sloppy farming practices, and we need to uh, uh, straighten up that, uh, that act considerably. Uh, the U.S. desperately needs to create a, a civilized welfare state, Medicare for all, uh, income supports, free education, child care, some kind of job guarantee and or minimum income. And we need to rebuild uh, the state's capacity to manage things effectively and humanely. Uh, the U.S. used to have a you know, very impressive scientific infrastructure uh, at the federal level, and it's just been um, savaged. Uh, and it's not, you know, Trump has certainly accelerated the decline, but it began uh, years ago. Uh, and uh, the, 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 uh, the, the, uh, the reign of austerity uh, in, in uh, the public sector over the last several decades has uh, helped make this crisis far worse than it needed to be. And I don't think it's enough just to do fiscal and monetary stimulus. It's not really about money or demand so much as really reshaping the productive structure, the real sector, as they say at Wall Street. The crisis is in the real sector. It's not so much in the financial sector. People can't work. Supply chains are broken. Um, you know, cities are just in deep, deep trouble. No amount of money printing alone can fix that. It might help, but only in rather limited ways. We really need to address the real sector in some kind of uh, more aggressive planning mechanism uh, where we think about what needs to be produced, how to produce it, uh, with uh, the public sector taking much more uh, control over that, uh, that kind of macroeconomic planning. Now, a year ago, this, these things would have, or even six months ago, these things might have sounded fanciful. Uh, the Green New Deal was dismissed by uh, House Speaker Nancy Pelosi as the green whatever when it was first proposed. Now, actually, a lot of this seems quite practical to me because we're not going to have any kind of recovery uh, spontaneously. Uh, and I don't think that just uh, creating new facilities by the Federal Reserve and a few trillion dollars into them is going to uh, create any kind of serious recovery. And now we even have a socialist beachhead in U.S. politics, which is something we didn't have a few years ago. So uh, this doesn't seem quite as fanciful as it did uh, once, uh, not all that long ago, really. 
Uh, over the last few decades, uh, neoliberalism has lowered expectations and encouraged a real consciousness of self-reliance. Uh, and uh, something that socialists need to do, and, uh, and our, our allies in the social democratic left, uh, need to do is articulate a vision of solidarity and mutual care. Uh, millions of lives depend on that. Thanks. Uh, thanks very much, Doug. And is this, oh, yeah. Right, yeah. Uh, sorry about the glitches there with the technology. Uh, even though we've been doing about umpteen of these things a day, it's still um, not always easy to get your head around. Um, so, uh, where, yeah, I lost my train of thought there. Yeah, thanks very much for that, Doug. And as I said earlier, if you want to do the uh, virtual wave or hand clap, you know, please do that. Show your appreciation for Doug's superb introduction. Now, um, what I've been asking people to do is, if you've got a question, uh, if you send it in the Q&A function rather than the chat, because it's easier for me to monitor. And Doug and Oslam, can you nod if you can see the questions? In the Q and A area, yes. that, that, that's great. That's great. So, um, just before we move on to taking a few questions, um, short ad break. You can follow Socialist Resistance on Facebook, Twitter, and you can sign up to the weekly mail shot that we send out, which keeps you up to date with recent articles and events. Um, if you've got a few quid spare in your pocket, International Viewpoint, the uh, website of the Fourth International, uh, needs uh, some cash to upgrade its operation. And there are details of how you can make a donation on the IV site or on the SR site. So let's move to a couple of questions. Uh, and this is all going to be a bit random. Um, so Mike Tucker is asking, uh, what do you think explains the apparent contradiction between the nationalist agenda trumpeted by Trump, uh, for example, his blame, blaming of the Chinese for the virus, with the Federal Reserve acting and bailing out the world's central banks? Um, Doug, that sounds like one for you. Do you fancy giving it a go? Yeah, um, well, I would say a couple of things. <clears throat> one uh, is that uh, Trump, of course, is insane. It's insane. He's always blaming everyone else for problems. I mean, that's just his first instinct. And he's a xenophobe. And uh, he has a visible contempt for China. You can hear it even the way he pronounces the word. It's just China, China. It's really a, a very hideous way of, uh, of referring to uh, the country that just drips um, racism and hatred. Uh, and so that, you know, that kind of explains Trump. I mean, the combination of xenophobia and his inability to accept any responsibility for anything. But, you know, the Federal Reserve, um, one doesn't have to like its class practices, uh, its class allegiances, but it is one of the few institutions of U.S. government that has remained some degree of, uh, retained some degree of competence, um, and uh, it still thinks of itself as having global responsibilities uh, to uh, its you know, the bourgeoisie around the world, and uh, it, it acts that way. And uh, Trump did his best to undermine that. He uh, wanted to appoint a couple of lunatics to the Federal Reserve Board um, who would have been uh, just, you know, certainly done a good bit to uh, destroy that institution the way many other institutions of American society have uh, have been destroyed. But, you know, I think at this point, the Federal Reserve still um, reflects uh, the consciousness of the, you know, the more sophisticated wing of the bourgeoisie, and, and, and it shows. Uh, it, it, has, it understands that it has international responsibility, and it understands that uh, issuing the world's most, still most important currency um, has uh, responsibilities that go beyond our borders. Uh, so, yeah, it, 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 it it's not yet uh, been affected with the uh, the collapse of uh, state capacity that the rest of the U.S. governing structure has been. Okay, so lots of us recently have become more dependent than would like on getting stuff from Amazon and using uh, Zoom and uh, 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 some of these big multinationals. Uh, Dave Kellaway is asking, uh, should there be some sort of windfall tax on the big supermarkets, which you're doing? stupendous trade at the minute, Zoom, Amazon, and um, what are effectively um, monopolies like that. Uh, I think that's one for both of you. Awesome. Do you want to address that one? Yes, sure. Dave, thank you for uh, making this uh, clear point. Um, I mean, it goes under my broad understanding that we have to seriously redesign taxation in terms of increasing taxes on corporate uh, profits. So corporate tax rate has fallen uh, tremendously in the past years across the globe in a uh, race to the bottom fashion. So we have to 
bring that back uh, to historically high levels. Um, we have to uh, make income taxation much more progressive in terms of increasing the top marginal income tax rates. Uh, but I think we should get uh, much more serious about uh, taxing uh, wealth. Just uh, to give an example, today in Britain, uh, average tax that we collect as a ratio to the stock of wealth is less than 1%. And just not too long ago, at the end of 70s, this was as high as 2%. If we were to only bring it back to where it was before in this country, uh, obviously, there is uh, no shortage of money. Um, but uh, yes, focusing on the winners of the crisis is also important. It's also uh, easy to uh, make the case. But we should start talking about taxing wealth uh, in a progressive way, and not in the way we do in Britain, which is a regressive taxation as the council uh, tax rate, which is the only tax rate that exists. Um, and, and we have to go beyond uh, just increasing the tax on inheritance. We have to seriously think how we can uh, tax wealth. And it, obviously, if these things are coordinated across countries, it's easier. Hence, the harm that will come with Brexit that will make coordination uh, more difficult, at least uh, for Britain across uh, Europe. Uh, but a lot of these things can be achieved uh, even when you're the only country doing it because other uh, countries don't have progressive governments that will uh, follow suit. Uh, Doug, oh, that, you want to add to that briefly? Yeah, I just want to add a couple of things to that. Um, the specific uh, companies that uh, uh, David Kelly mentioned, uh, Amazon, Zoom, the supermarkets, actually they're not making a lot much money. I don't think Zoom makes any money. Uh, Amazon uh, is... Uh, by the standards of most corporations, are actually fairly thinly profitable, uh, and uh, they're they're not making much this quarter. Uh, the supermarkets, I don't know whether their, their sales are up, but I don't know their their costs are probably up too. So I don't know exactly um, how they're doing on balance. But uh, to the point that Oslin made, um, personal wealth. You know, Amazon is as a company may not be making all that much money, but Jeff Bezos certainly is. I mean, that guy's what 130 billion dollars. Some of these plutocrats have actually uh, seen their wealth rise uh, in uh, the last uh, few weeks or months. Um, they, you know, we need to go after them. And you know, it's really a limited source of on re recurring revenue. I mean, if you start taxing wealth in a substantial way, the wealth will disappear. But that should be a, that's the idea. I mean, we want to expropriate these guys and reduce their economic and political power. So you know, in the short term, wealth tax might be a nice way to uh, to to uh, to pay off some of the debt we're acquiring getting out of this crisis. Uh, but in the long term, it'd be a nice way just to, to uh, uh, Keynes spoke of the euthanasia, the rentier, I think uh, uh, the rentiers are not going to consent to their, their euthanasia. So perhaps, you know, uh, uh, a polite guillotine of the rentier. Mm. Yeah. And um, right. Should I mention as well during the ad break there that uh, Doug also runs a podcast behind, called Behind the News, which is very good. And, uh, uh, lots of high level discussion on economics. Uh, next question, it's co quite a controversial subject among some socialist resistance supporters. It's from Anna on the universal ba basic income. And, um, right, uh, Doug Oslem, what do you think about the universal basic income, the carbon fee and dividend idea? I'll give you a couple of minutes each on that. Do you want to go first? Yeah. But, who wants to go first? Doesn't matter. Okay, I'll let me go first. Doug spoke last. Okay. Yeah. Well, I, Anna, good question. I did use the word universal basic free services uh, in my list of where do we go from here uh, alternatives. And I deliberately did not refer to universal basic income. I don't mind the use of uh, helicopter money uh, as a short-run emergency uh, transfer of income to everyone uh, because it's easy to administer. So a short-run emergency universal basic income for a month, two months. But I would very much like to see uh, a designed long-termist uh, plan and universal basic income is not, in my opinion, a part of that. Permanent public jobs, well-paid, well-organized, delivering for the future, 
the services that we need uh, and the infrastructure that we need. It's part of that. Um, so instead of uh, giving everyone the same money uh, when actually people have different needs, I would be in favor of giving voice, representation, valuing what matters, hence decent wages for the new uh, key jobs we are creating. Uh, and that uh, ranges, in my opinion, um, thinking of uh, you know public transport workers, uh, municipality uh, workers who uh, you know collect our uh, bins, uh, but also to uh, social care workers, uh, to healthcare workers, nursery teachers, all these underpaid people, along with obviously other workers in the health sector. Um, thinking of uh, building houses, insulating houses, uh, creating jobs while we are transitioning to a zero carbon economy. People who will build the uh, wind farms um, uh, up and down the country. Um, so th these should be permanent employees uh, and well paid uh, people. Um, we need to uh, also train uh, these people because uh, there's skill shortages actually in these areas. So that will also need uh, you know a, a whole army of uh, trainers. We need money for that. There is money. Uh, we know how to finance all this, but I don't see why we have to pay a low and the same level of income to everyone when people uh, with and without uh, children, with or without disabilities, uh, living in different parts of the uh, country, uh, are facing very different uh, needs. And, and uh, you know, there's also a lot of things that are related to uh, citizenship status, uh, which as a migrant uh, makes me also additionally uh, allergic. Um, uh, so, um, while I'm uh, very much sympathetic to the idea that everyone should be entitled to a decent uh, living standard, I would rather like to provide it through creation of millions of decent uh, jobs uh, and also providing basic services free. So nobody should worry about what will ha happen to their social care when they're old. We shouldn't worry about uh, public transport. There has to be decent public transport. I don't have a car and I shouldn't be told that I should rather drive to work and not use public transport. Um, and all this uh, would sort out the income problem while giving all of us access to a life with dignity, with lifelong education from cradle to grave, as the former Labour Party manifesto had said and uh, health uh, integrated with social care, um, access to human rights defined as including decent housing, uh, access to public transport, clean air, and all that requires oh, so got spending of, money of, and questions. Yeah, we've got okay. a line of questions uh, queued up here, so uh, I need to get Doug in on this. Yeah, yeah I would. Uh, uh, and I, this I, is I, on the basic income and the carbon fee. Yeah, yeah I... Um, don't have a strong opinion of the carbon fee and dividend idea, but I, I, I agree with everything that Oslam said about uh, the universal basic income. And I would add a couple of things. Um, and, and I prefer universal basic services rather than universal basic income. And there are a couple of reasons. If, if you look at uh, the numbers involved, um, if you do have a universal basic income, it would have to be really kind of small. Um, and, uh, you know, if it just quickly becomes such a giant portion of GDP, you don't even know how the uh, the society would, uh, or the economy could reproduce itself. Um, now there are libertarians uh, who support the universal basic income, all these Silicon Valley types, well, I wouldn't say they all do, but some of them do, uh, who support it for, uh, because they want to just end the welfare state. They want to end every other aspect of the welfare state and just uh, stuff it all to the UBI. And this is a very, you know, consumerist marketized idea of, of how to approach basic needs. It's just, uh, uh, here you, you, here's some money for you, choose to spend it your way. Uh, I think the idea of decommodifying a lot of basic services is much more politically compelling. Uh, <coughs> and uh, like I said, the, the UBI would have to be quite small. Uh, if, if it were truly universal. Um, so I, I, I'm, not, I'm not impressed by, uh, by that. And I do think that there's so many things that need to be done in a society. Uh, the kinds of basic caregiving that is needed, uh, the environmental reconstruction, the rebuilding, the infrastructure, all those sorts of things that would be part of, the, of, of, a, of a Green New Deal. Um, 
and we do need a public jobs program to do that. Uh, so it's a combination of getting people needed income and getting work done that really, really uh, urgently needs to be done and work of the sort that the, the market would never take care of. So that's, I much prefer that to, uh, to the UBI. Yeah. And your reference to environmental reconstruction, I suppose, brings us on to a question from Alan, uh, which is, how do we make the ecological and environmental progress out of this situation? Uh, awesome. Do you want to come in on that first and then, Doug? I'll, I mean, a lot of the things we have said, I think, answers are that uh, purple and green uh, New Deal calling for public investment while creating jobs, redeploying people who will become unemployed permanently because some sectors will never recover in the uh, socially uh, and environmentally uh, needed uh, sectors. So you can uh, redeploy Rolls Royce workers producing for the uh, aerospace uh, industry in uh, the wind farm industry um, or, or the people working for the airlines uh, as uh, care workers uh, but, but obviously that only works if you pay them a decent uh, wage and offer them a, a lifelong uh, trajectory to uh, educate uh, and access uh, you know, basically a career plan for the rest of their lives. Um, the other thing that is, I think, important is to tie any uh, fiscal as well as monetary policy tool uh, to conditionality about uh, green investment uh, by firms. So Bank of England or uh, Federal Reserve or European Central Bank should not be buying bonds uh, of uh, corporations that are uh, contributing to uh, global uh, warming climate change. So that we should define sectors, uh, label them as green sectors or green bonds, um, and Bank of England should be allowed to only buy such bonds if it's using that as a tool for its uh, monetary policy quantitative easing. Uh, similarly, uh, I said it uh, at the end of my talk, uh, if we are advocating uh, support for uh, firms in the form, it could be in the form of loans. I'd rather uh, have that in the form of buying equities of the firms, meaning the government buying equities from firms. And funny enough, this is not a radical political economy proposal anymore. anymore. Today, it was in the editorial of the Financial Times. How do we deal with that mountain of both corporations uh, and countries? So buying equities, but making it uh, a condition that uh, they do invest uh, in contributing to greening the economy, uh, as well as obviously uh, uh, having the workforce as represented by the trade union, um, having a clear uh, commitment to uh, improving working conditions, pay, shortening working time, and of course, shortening the working time itself and allowing people uh, also to work from home and commuting less all that is part of uh, ecological transitioning none of that will become will be automatic a lot of the people i see are asking questions how do we organize uh, to do that sadly today they call us to cycle home uh, and uh, come uh, the recovery uh, they will be uh, again uh, uh, pulling um, support for automotive industry producing cars so uh, of course the iris the, the the bailout of airlines and all that uh, without conditionality in terms of uh, how they will gradually transition and downsize uh, and how we uh, you know, uh, think of seriously downsizing air travel and so on none of that will be uh, there automatically and a lot of the achievements that we are having at the moment because of the lockdown are all temporary and reversible. So or I, I empathize a lot with the people who say we have to organize around this. But I think we, we know the tools, how to use uh, government policies to intervene. Uh, but as Liam, uh, Liam in the audience, not Liam, uh, the chair, uh, is asking, um, we can't wait for a Labour government for another five years to come. So how do we put pressure on the existing governments? Um, and I think um, this is something that is worth discussing too. 
And I'm going to uh, invest British labour movement uh, traditions. I'm going to try and compensate two questions on that subject uh, as, Don, as, uh, as Doug speaks. Don, if you want to come back on uh, the question about the ecological situation. Do you want me to talk? Uh, yeah, yeah. Oh, uh, sorry. Yes. Um, well, I think it's absolutely uh, crucial to uh, have uh, ecological content to uh, any recovery program. I, when I talk about the Green New Deal, I mean both the Green part and the New Deal part. And the Green part includes a large social provision as well uh, of care work and, and, and income support, welfare state stuff. You know, we, it, you know, the Scandinavian welfare states are, are far, uh, far from socialism and are far less generous than they used to be. But to an American, you know, it looks like... Uh, <laughs> paradise on earth. Uh, but it, it'd be very, very expensive uh, to have that kind of welfare state. But it has to be a green one. It can't be just more of the same crap. I, I'm, I'm somewhat concerned that uh, the nature of this pandemic will uh, it only encourage some of the worst instincts in American life. That the fact that the, uh, the disease has been so concentrated in New York City will turn people against urban life. Uh, that people will want to live uh, out in sprawly uh, su suburbs. They'll want to drive their cars because trains and subways are dangerous. Uh, and it may just uh, begin this kind of uh, uh, attempt to live inside a plastic bubble rather than any kind of uh, rich human community. Um, and I, I hope we can avoid that, uh, that fate because that would be ecologically and socially bad to, uh, to, uh, to try to Take, take refuge in our little bubbles and not uh, try to live together uh, in uh, you know, solidarity and health. Uh, but yeah, we have to make ecological pro progress out of this situation or I don't think we can really get out of it in any meaningful way because climate change just means more pandemics, and more, more generalized suffering and uh, uh, more social fissures, more social crises and we just really uh, have to address that promptly. Um, we do in the United States have the possibility of having a new government next year. God knows it's, you know, Joe Biden is not an inspiring leader, uh, and uh, the mainstream Democratic Party is certainly not going to lead us to the promised land, but does at least offer, I don't know, some hope for something marginally better, but also uh, a group uh, in power that is possibly more uh, amenable to pressure from the left. Um, so I mean, th we do have that possibility that Britain doesn't have, at least we don't have uh, you know, five years more of Boris Johnson to, to deal with. Although we may have four years of Donald Trump to deal with. But if that happens, I think we might as well just fold up this place and close it up. Yeah. So uh, to both the panelists, while the other one's answering the next question, if you can have a look at the one from Mike about the big breakup of the British state and Scotland and try and put together a couple of thoughts in it, on it. Uh, it might be harder for you, Doug, than for Oslam. Uh, so what I'm going to do is try and combine, to the best of my ability, the questions from Liam, the other Liam, and Samuel. Uh, and you know, the way I've worked it out is, uh, what would a strategy for putting pressure on leaders in the United in the United States and Britain be? And how do we organise the working class to cope with the situation, given the apparent failure of previous forms of working class organisation? Who wants to give that one a go? <laughs> That's too hard for me. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, shall I give it, give a, it a go? Give it a go. Yeah. Uh, like Angela Rayner today said, join a union. Uh, I suppose that applies to everyone uh, in, in this uh, meeting today, uh, meaning we are all part of the unions. Um, let's uh, put pressure on the political organizations that we are uh, involved in uh, beyond the unions. Uh, that includes uh, the Labour Party uh, on my part. Um, to go beyond uh, saying we will uh, plan the exit from the lockdown better um, and we will uh, have a better design for our uh, program and increase testing and uh, contact tracing uh, workers uh, and peak supply. All these are fine, but it's a little bit too similar to the 2008 crisis, post-2008 labor policy. Uh, it's too little, too late kind of response uh, when in 2010, the conservative government came to power. Um, so we need to um, stop uh, clapping uh, the chancellor, uh, but so uh, how he should tie that to a permanent uh, change that addresses the inequalities that are making the crisis uh, worse in this country. So let's um, 
not despair, uh, get organized uh, and put pressure on larger organizations that have more leverage, in my opinion, in Britain that refers to the Labour Party, uh, still uh, a very effective organization uh, to put pressure uh, on the government and for mass mobilization. Uh, and uh, f f in terms of day-to-day -day survival at the workplace, uh, let's uh, make all the use of our unions. Uh, occupational disease and health and safety is a big concern uh, for the working class, including the uh, more privileged uh, ones, but certainly it's a matter of life and death uh, for the ones uh, in the front line. Um, did you want Liam us to say something about Mike's point about uh, the disunited? Uh, well, as, um, as what I said was, well, uh, each of you is speaking, the, the other comrade can pull their thoughts together on it. So, I mean, if you feel you can address the Scottish question now, um, please do. Otherwise, no, let, let, me, let me do it later because it's a different discussion. It, it is indeed, yeah. yeah, yeah. There are a few yeah. other people. Okay, Oslam, if, if you let Doug come in now, yeah. Okay, I could do both parts in, in about a minute or two. Um, I think the, uh, you know, there's some interesting organizing going on in the United States right now. Um, that uh, we've seen strikes, small, but uh, they have great potential in um, some sectors like Whole Foods, Instacart, people who shop at, at grocery stores and deliver to people. Uh, they've been uh, uh, rather small, but encouraging strikes in these areas uh, among workers who you know, are not they don't work together. It's, it's a different kind of you know, work uh, organization to, to organize workers who don't necessarily work under the same roof. Um, but there's interesting stuff going on that through social media and stuff that uh, uh, that uh, have uh, hit over the last couple of weeks. I think there's a receptivity to militancy and organizing among uh, broad sections of the public uh, that uh, might not have existed 10, 15 years ago. Um, the uh, the brutality of the American ruling class, the political side and the economic side, um, has just been so much on view. It's like, get back to work, we don't care if you die attitude that a lot of conservative politicians and business people have been uh, pushing up in recent weeks, uh, I think really makes the, the class divide just so stark, so visible that even people are not particularly inclined politically um, can, can really see it. So th there is great potential there. Of course, it has to be organized. Uh, existing labor unions are not uh, necessarily very inspiring. There's uh, another interesting uh, effort going on, Amazonians United to organize uh, Amazon workers. Um, that seems to be more of a long-term effort, uh, operating perhaps more under the radar. Uh, but uh, yeah, th there's there's interesting stuff going on, so that that's hopeful. And uh, uh, the longer this goes on, I think the more angry people are going to get. Um, now, we're not on the verge of breaking up in the same way that Britain is, but on the other hand, the, the regional uh, uh, tensions in the United States that have emerged over this have been really, really stark. Uh, and the failure of the national government to respond in any kind of coherent way has forced governors to respond on their own and also uh, states to create these little regional compacts. Um, there are seven states in the Northeast that have created a compact. Uh, the three Pacific states have created a compact to, to coordinate policies and to um, um, uh, uh, do joint buying of crucial healthcare equipment uh, to, so that they can uh, negotiate together and maybe have uh, better uh, influence over the terms. So we do see this, uh, and then at the same time, we see the, the heartland, uh, the South and parts of the Midwest, uh, where there's a whole lot of skepticism about the disease, uh, reluctance to take any kind of uh, restrictive measures. Um, so we're seeing this big division between, you know, in the cliche of US politics, between the blue states and the red states. Uh, that you know is really interesting for the long term. Um, the, the failure of the national government, uh, uh, combined with you know what can be often a very dysfunctional federal system that we have, with, uh, uh, competing responsibilities, divided responsibilities among the states and localities. Uh, on the other hand, you know we do see this kind of organizing at the state level um, in alternate as an alternative uh, to the federal government because the federal government is failing so badly. So if it's not leading to some kind of breakup, it does. Um, there, we are seeing um, greatly um, increased and exposed tensions uh, on a regional level. It could have interesting uh, developments in, in, in the years to come because you know, it's kind of hard to uh, imagine these things going away anytime soon. And uh, just in the question of unionization, the National Education Union um, acquired 2,000 new members on Sunday night after Johnson's speech. And uh, a union meeting uh, I attended uh, using this technology this afternoon was one of the best attended 
we've ever had because Osdom is absolutely right. For a lot of people, get back, going back in the work now is a question of life and death. And I think we might be seeing um, right, a very significant period of new unionization. Now, we're going to take two more questions so that we can finish in decent time because I know that these devices can be a bit of a strain for everybody. So uh, we'll take. Um, Mike's question on Scotland, the breakup of the British state. And then there's, uh, I think, an interesting one um, on ethno-nationalism, uh, which we return to in a couple of minutes. Okay, so, um, Oslam, since you live in the British state, uh, do you want to begin with that one? I think we don't need the COVID, or we didn't need the COVID-19 uh, uh, pandemic uh, to to see uh, the disintegration in uh, the United Kingdom, uh, Brexit uh, did it uh, for them. So the prospects of uh, a united Ireland um, is never as high. But Liam should say more about that, uh, knowing the uh, Republic of Ireland and North of Ireland much better than me. Uh, and of course. Uh, the, the, the Scottish uh, voters have been totally ignored. And when we see how uh, Wales, Scotland uh, are now managing uh, the crisis uh, and their communication strategy, uh, one would actually like to live in Scotland as opposed to England, um, a feeling that I developed since uh, Brexit. Um, uh, well, I, I don't have an answer to Mike's question. Uh, question and um, it is uh, a difficult one in terms of um, the, the transitioning uh, in a small uh, economy uh, as which as Mike uh, is also pointing it uh, so far depending on uh, oil income and um, whether that tr transitioning uh, towards a green uh, new Scotland is achieved more easily in an independent Scotland um, is, I think, a very interesting discussion. And the little uh, I understood from the Scottish uh, referendum, uh, most of the pro-referendum uh, campaigners' point was not independence just for the sake of independence under any conditions, but they were saying it is a lot easier for Sco an independent Scotland so scrap trident um, to uh, stop austerity, uh, to, to in, in improve uh, the public sector. Uh, and of course, looking at the university sector again, um, I would rather uh, see uh, Scotland being uh, closer uh, to uh, an, an economy which can scrap the tuition fees. Um, compared to uh, England. So I, I, I would see these all from the perspective of the uh, movements um, in Scotland versus uh, England. Um, but um, yeah, yeah the, the, it is not looking, uh, the, the government's response to COVID is not facilitating um, overcoming the existing polarization as well as imbalances uh, in the uh, United uh, Kingdom. There's one more question that I would very much like to pick up, Liam. Am I allowed to? Is that a bit uh, um, too let, orderly let, let about the working let, let from home? back on the breakup of the state, then we'll deal with the ethno-nationalism thing. And then if you want to come back briefly on the final one, and that should yeah. take us up to about 825, 830, I would reckon. Don't you recommend? Uh, well, um, I did say something about uh, the, uh, the increasing regional tensions in the U.S. It's certainly not uh, analogous to, to Britain, um, but um, they, they are serious and I think growing and uh, likely to increase. Um, you know, I opposed Brexit uh, from from this distance, and I, it's, it's kind of uh, I, I don't know. People might think I don't have the right to comment on that, but uh, just uh, uh, any kinds of nationalisms right now, I find very disturbing. And I thought that the nationalism that uh, uh, that that drove Brexit was um, very sad. And for similar reasons, I, I did I oppose the uh, the, uh, the Scottish uh, uh, independence refer referendum just because I just don't like nationalisms and they make me very uncomfortable. But after Brexit, I mean, I, I I'm now cheering on Scottish independence. I think uh, break away and leave England to to stew in its own foul juices. <laughs> Well, I, th I think we might have an, um, a meeting on Scotland in the pipeline in a month or two. 
uh, I think that's a bit of a work in progress, so we can return to that. Um, now, in addition to being economists, the other thing that Doug and Osdom have in common is that they both uh, come from countries with ethno-nationalist leaderships at the minute. Um, this this uh, pandemic crisis, how do you think it's enabled in these regimes at the moment? Osdom, do you want to make a start on that one? Well, uh, to date we should uh, aid, of course, uh, Turkey, um, Russia, um, but the, the, list, the list is sadly uh, long. Uh, and I'm so surprised how mainstream TV channels uh, are uh, spreading fake news about the virus being lab produced. Or, or an alternative version, a very anti-Semitic version uh, of uh, the uh, human uh, creation of uh, the virus. And uh, I hear that uh, recycled um, in the Turkish TV channels, establishment channels, huge channels, sitting on huge uh, you know, um, advertisement income. Um, and it's not social media that's spreading you know, uh, minor fake news. And, and people are buying into that, that of course, uh, we should see that, um, we should uh, take stock of this. Uh, it's also on us, how ineffective uh, we have been um, in, um, in talking about the role of the agribusiness, uh, multinationals, and how ineffective we have been um, in organizing people in political uh, movements, broadly speaking, such that they are not so prone to uh, such fake news. But um, yes, sadly, this will happen. Uh, and as much as we favor a certain uh, deglobalization in terms of living uh, more local, um, flying less, um, consuming uh, goods produced by our uh, neighbors and uh, small collectives in our neighborhoods, uh, we should also see that these trends will go along with border controls, um, you know, locking down borders, uh, having them open only to citizens and not even residents. Um, uh, the, the pandemic is not uh, making human reactions, uh, it's not always bringing out the best in humans, as much as we like pricing all the solidarity networks that are happening. So we see a polarization, we see the good in humans coming out, as well as really the, uh, the, the evil. And uh, you know, we are starting from uh, a disadvantage point in being close to these people, who are more ready to hear the stories that the Chinese uh, have produced the virus in the lab or the rich have produced it such that they decrease world population uh, and which comes with versions of uh, anti-Semitic uh, conspiracies attached to that. So it is a difficult time and the, the, the task is amounting so we should be very vigilant about this. Okay, thanks for uh, chosen. them. Uh, just a reminder, if you want to make a couple of quick donations to International Viewpoint, go on the International Viewpoint website or the SR website. Doug, do you want to come back in this ethno-nationalism yeah, question? Yeah, um, well, we certainly got a, a, our own kinds of that here, um, starting with the, the president um, and some of his significant supporters, his uh, top aide and speechwriter, uh, Stephen Miller, um, who is, I mean, there's no other word for him, but uh, white ethno-nationalist, um, horrifying, bigot, chilly, frightening character. Uh, and a lot of people around Trump, uh, a lot of people in the Republican Party. Um, and they, Trump, you know, he, he didn't create this movement, but it certainly energized uh, the, the, the far right in the US, uh, neo-Nazis, you know, neo-Confederates and all this. Uh, we've uh, seen uh, increasing evidence of them. And they've been all over this open America stuff uh, with their automatic weapons. Uh, uh, waltzing into state capitals. You know, it's just amazing. You can carry an automatic rifle into the Michigan State Capitol building, but you can't carry a protest sign. Uh, that's, uh, that's America for you there. Um, and, you know, these people feel really emboldened. On the other hand, we saw the other day uh, some uh, um, black people escorting a black legislator into the Michigan State Legislature. Uh, carrying automatic weapons to protect her. So on the other, on one hand, you know, it's kind of frightening to see this kind of signs of uh, 
mounting um, civil tension. And, you know, people talk about a, a civil war in the U.S., uh, which seems not impossible. But on the other hand, I mean, that kind of self-defense, I'm afraid, in a, such a, a country that's so heavily armed, it's, you know, getting to be necessary. I had somebody on my radio show last week who's a member of the Socialist Rifle Association, uh, and they're all taking up arms to uh, develop a, 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 an ethic and an institution of collective self-defense. Um, so I mean, that's, that's one response to the, the growth of ethno-nationalism in this country. It is a minority. It's not the, the majority of the public, the public is not moved by this. The majority of the public does not support these open up protests or any of that. But on the other hand, the hostility to China is real deep and growing and, and Trump is doing his best to promote that. Uh, and, um, and we're um, seeing a lot of Democrats playing along with this. They're, they're even tempted to say that Trump has been too soft on China. Um, so the, the anti-China stuff is really ugly and scary, and uh, you combine that kind of you know visceral um, kind of I don't know, you can think of it as like retail um, ethno-nationalism with an increasing uh, posture of hostility in the military and political levels towards China, and you get a very very frightening uh, mix. Uh, you know, there's some people I think who would like. Uh, to go to war with China. And this started under the, when Hillary Clinton was Secretary of State, she talked about the pivot to Asia, by which she meant moving U.S. policy attention away from Europe and towards containing the rising power of China. Uh, and that is something that uh, Trump has uh, continued in a more crude uh, fashion than Hillary Clinton. You know, she a sophisticated person who could uh, use the English language skillfully um, and knew how to be diplomatic. Uh, Trump, you know, is, is an idiot who, who can't speak a sentence and uh, hatred uh, you know, oozes out of every pore of his body. But uh, you know, the, the message is pretty much the same. It's pretty anti-Chinese and it's pretty scary. Okay, Oslem, there was something you wanted to come back on briefly before we conclude? Yes, uh, I just wanted to uh, respond to Johnny's point about working from home, uh, that people uh, used to find that uh, isolating. Obviously, the whole idea of transitioning to a, an alternative society where we work shorter hours, but then we have time to uh, participate in decision making, be active in uh, political movements, uh, parties, uh, trade unions, uh, and still have time uh, to care, to love, to have fun, to dance. Um, well, in a, in a combination like that, obviously, if people could combine working in workplaces with doing some work uh, uh, from home, that's, that could be very liberating as opposed to uh, isolating because uh, you simply uh, lose less time uh, with commuting, no matter how you commute, uh, it would still not be uh, as relaxing as cycling uh, on your free time if you're cycling to work. So uh, I, I suppose uh, Patrick was adding to that discussion about how the digital revolution is changing all that. Um, so there are a lot of positives happening about how we can transition to an alternative uh, economy where uh, we uh, work less, uh, but have more time uh, to care and have more time uh, for, for ourselves, but also for politics uh, is, is emergent there. But with respect to digitalization, of course, I should say, um, employers are also not all stupid. They're finding very uh, sneaky ways of how they can monitor their workers when they're working from home. So it's a double-sided uh, sword, but uh, we should, um, we should uh, think more about uh, the, the oldest demand of the working class movement that's uh, shortening of the work week and tie it to how we can create time for organizing uh, for radical transformation. And this is how I suppose we transform our parties as well as our unions, because someone was saying, well, unions are rotten. Well, if you, if rank and file union members spend more time organizing in their unions, uh, all union leadership is up for grabs to transform uh, and then uh, to, to do the things that we find important to do. My trade union has been transformed quite significantly in the recent years, uh, though a 15 days long general strike has been quite abruptly, of course, interrupted by the pandemic, but uh, change is possible. And I think small unions organizing rank and file workers are putting immense pressure on large unions like GMB, who, by the way, has been very good in organizing uh, workers on zero hour contracts or 
so-called self-employed uh, gig economy workers. So again, I'm going to come back to ourselves. Uh, it's down to us. Uh, yes, we can make it. Uh, and sorry, it's not easy and we shouldn't be all uh, tunefulist, I think. It, it is, uh, it's a daunting test ahead of us. Okay. Right, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to unmute everybody in a second so we can give Osdem and Doug a genuine round of applause for uh, two very stimulating contributions and question and answer sessions. And we hope to see you back on uh, Socialist Resistance's uh, next web seminar. So I'll unmute and then everybody clap, please. Thank you. Uh, hold on. Uh, uh, hold on. All right. Okay. Oh, this has been a great discussion. Thank you. Thank okay. you. Thank so, you. Thanks very much, comrades. That didn't quite work out as a plan. Uh, have a good evening. Okay. Bye -bye. Thanks for having me. Bye.